Wow, thank you, Art. I appreciate that. Um, it's great to be with you, and I always enjoy a chance to speak, and it always comes in the summertime when Dan goes on vacation, and I just count it a blessing, and just to be in God's Word, uh, kind of a lot more than normal to prepare a message, uh, leaves me in a very, I just love it. Um, I just think of how good God's Word is, and kind of thinking of what Dan said, that um, what well, certainly lifts us. And to have God's word before us every day, I think it builds us up. It's like, it's like a vitamin. It's like all the fiber you need. It's like all the protein for your life is God's word. And um, today I, I've got a message um, on uh, Matthew chapter 11. Jesus says, come to me and take my yoke upon you. And that will be the topic of our message. If you want to open your Bible, it's in Matthew chapter 11. We'll look at the verses there from verse 25 to to verse 30. Um, but here we're dealing with a promise at the end of this. And I just want to just share a quick story and then open up in prayer. When I was, I was probably like 18, and I was actually working for Dan's dad. I, I'd show up there for work every morning at 6 a.m. And every Friday, we get our paychecks. It was awesome. Except your first Friday. You didn't get your paycheck then. You always, because it's a week afterwards. It's always exciting to get that paycheck on Friday, and I was always happy to grab the paycheck, right? And I take the paycheck, and I take it home, and because I was a college student living with my parents just like a mile away, I didn't burn any gas, and I worked for Dan's dad as long as I was awake. That's kind of like the schedule at that time was wake up, come to work, go home, go to bed. Like that was the schedule. Like go home, take a shower, go to bed, do it again. And so you didn't have time to like go out and like even go to a bank. Well, I, I would go grocery shopping, and I'd buy, like, little Debbie cakes and, like, two pounds of turkey every week. That was my diet, and that was awesome. But I didn't spend a lot of money, so I'd get my first check. I'd cash that check, and I wouldn't cash any other checks. I had all these checks, and after, like, oh, like near, like, the middle of, like, uh, August, like, one of my, uh, my first year there, I was getting ready to go back to college, and uh, or to go to college, and he's like, um, hey, um... I need you to cash all the checks I've given you. You haven't cashed any of them. I'm like, I have to, I have to cash them. He's like, they're not doing you any good. You're not, you're not cashing them. I just think it's like a promise from God. He's written you the check, but you haven't cashed it yet. All the other guys would pick on me like, well, Bruce doesn't have to cash his checks. Can I borrow some money from you? We joke around about that, and they pick on me, but. I had a pretty small lifestyle eating little Debbie cakes and turkey sandwiches. So, But uh, here we have a promise at the end. Jesus says, come to me. And at the end he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And just such an exciting text. And before we get into it, I just want to pray with you. And I pray that we can really get the idea here that the Lord is trying to share with us. And so, Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, for this morning. Lord, that we can open your word. We open it freely. And Lord, we call you our Father. We thank you, God, that you give us promises and that you're able to fulfill them and, and that you've done all things for us, Lord. There's not a, a promise that you would not make that you cannot fulfill. You do everything perfectly. And so, Lord, as we open this text, we pray that we, we grow from reading it, that we would depend on the promise. And we have a devotion and a love to you, Lord, and a trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in Matthew chapter 11, I'll just read a few verses there right at the beginning. Um, I'm just going to read the first couple of verses, verse 25 through 27. It says, At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and reveal them to little children. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. I just take a, I just when I look at these and share these with people, I just break apart different words on them and just the first one there it says Jesus Declare. When Jesus says something, it is a sure thing. You can trust the promise of God. He can be completely dependent upon. 
The Lord Jesus is the promise giver in this part of the scripture. And no one ever makes a promise like Jesus. There's nobody that makes promises like Jesus. I love hearing people make promises because I feel as though I quickly come to the conclusion they probably cannot do what they said they would do. People have lots of great intentions. They say, I will get that done. They probably don't get it done most of the time. I hear lots of political speeches this time of year. We're in an election year. I will do this. I will do that. I will balance a budget. We will have a deficit. Folks, I don't put a lot of stock in those. If Jesus said that, I would say, yes, I know it is sure. But when men say it, I don't trust them. I don't trust them. And so we can absolutely trust when the Lord says he will fulfill the promise. The problems that we have cannot be really solved by anyone else except him. He will fix all issues. Um, how many times have I been disappointed by someone making a promise? I can remember when I was a little kid, when one of my, my best friend's dad's like, I'm going to pick you guys up Wednesday and we're going to go fishing together. I'm sitting there out in front of the barn. I've got a fishing pole, a bucket of frogs, worms. I've got everything. He couldn't come. He got called into work. It was just a total fluke. But like I still this day, I'm like 35 years past that point. I haven't forgotten that. But I know everything the Lord promises is true and is fulfilled. Jesus said, I thank you, Father. When he calls God his Father, He's doing something that no one else does. We say Father all the time when we pray. We say our Father who art in heaven. That's a normal prayer for us. But when Jesus said Father at this time, nobody else talked like that. Isaiah didn't call God his Father. Abraham didn't call God. Moses didn't call God his Father. John the Baptist didn't call God his Father. But Jesus says, I thank you, Father, it makes me think of what Dave was saying last week. When Jesus speaks, he speaks with authority. And when he calls God his Father, it's because he has authority from God the Father. And all things are given into his hands. He has all power. It's a statement of his authority. And so we know that if he has the authority, he can make a promise. He certainly can. Mm. This next statement, it says, he says, um, Jesus said, you've hidden these things from the wise and revealed them to little children. And he's thankful to God the Father. That Jesus, uh, that he's opened the eyes of these ones who have faith like little children, who simply believe. And at the same time, he says, the wise and understanding of this world do not comprehend it. Think about that for a moment. The wise who have much understanding in this world miss the things of the gospel. The scriptures even say, Paul said this, is where is the wise? Where is the scribe, the one who writes a lot, who writes a lot of the law? Where is the debater of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that and the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. That is, by me sharing the message of salvation, the gospel of what Jesus has done. That pleases God. He even calls this foolishness. The work I do today is foolishness. The wise people of this world are building bigger buildings. They're making new laws. They're developing new ideas. They're doing things that they think are going to solve the world. God says that's not going to fix the world. God says that Jesus Christ, he can solve the problems of this world. The authority is given to him. These people think much of themselves. A wise person thinks much of himself. You know, I talk to wise people all the time. I was at the fair and I'll share some of those with you now. I talk to some people and they say, no, no, I've got this issue with um, evolution versus science. I have this, this, this problem. We'll say, if, if God is so good, how come bad things happen? These people have these great intellectual arguments. Their problem is not one of intellect. Their problem is one of sin. 
They will not cease from their adultery. They will not cease from their fornication. That's why they won't come to Christ. So these ones who are wise and have all kinds of understanding and seem so great, their real objection is not in anything in Christ. It's that they think they're great and that they love themselves and their sin beyond Jesus. They think so much of themselves. And that's why Jesus says, Father, I thank you. You've blinded their eyes, but you've revealed these things to the little ones, to these children, to these with childlike faith. It's incredible. And that verse there in 1 Corinthians, I quoted before, it says, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And I just think of that, that those who will glory in the Lord and not their own glory truly give praise to God. And there's no glory in ourselves, but only in Christ. And that's what Jesus, he stands there and thanks his Father for. Before he gives this invitation, he says, Father, I thank you. You blinded their eyes. You blinded the wise of this world's eyes. But you've unveiled the eyes of these who have this childlike faith like little children. I thank God for that. I do. There's so many examples of this in Scripture. In, uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus gives sight to a blind man. And the Pharisees don't understand it. At the end of the conversation, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you're the ones who are blind because you don't see your sin. And that the, uh, their blindness is a result of them not seeing their sin. In the same manner, in the chapter in, earlier in this chapter in Matthew, Jesus speaks of the uh, uh, people in, the, in, in Capernaum, that city, and he says, woe to you in Capernaum. He says, if the works Jesus had done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. I just think of that. How blinding is pride. That the, the works that Jesus did in that area around there, in Capernaum, uh, absolutely blinded. Uh, these people were blinded by their own pride, so they couldn't see what Jesus was doing. They had a sense of spirit. They, they had blindness, spiritual blindness. But I thank God to those who God, he has opened their eyes. I, I think on how when someone understands their sin and they humble themselves and they see themselves as a sinner before God, that's opening their eyes. That's glory. That's great. Now they see their need for Christ. Their blindness is removed. My old pastor in Baltimore used to say, um, we'd meet someone and we'd say, boy, they, don't, they, they need the Lord. You know, like we could meet them and know, well, there's a lot going on in their life and, and they need Christ. And maybe there's some situations at home, at work. It could be with addiction. And we'd always say, they're a candidate for the kingdom. You know, they're so messed up. They're more qualified for God than ever before. And I just, I think on that and I think, that's what we were. That's what I was. Uh, in, in so, so messed up, needing Christ. And that's what God calls glorious. When someone can see their need for Christ. And that when we glory, we glory in, in God. Not in our own. Hmm. Later in the verse it says, uh, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And Jesus, he explains his authority. He said, you see, God the Father has handed all these things over to me. This is throughout Scripture. This isn't just one, one place here. One, one verse, Jesus says, it says, Jesus even said this in Matthew 28, he says, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. The one who makes the promise here that we're going to read in a moment has all authority in heaven and earth. Hallelujah. Jesus' authority extends into the future, far above rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the ones to come. Philippians 2 says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, 
and every tongue confess in heaven and earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' authority, he can fulfill the promise. So the one who says come, he can do it. He calls you and he is able to help you. Um, you, maybe you've done this before, but you're talking to someone about Jesus. And they may have a misunderstanding of who Jesus is. They may not understand him as God. They may think he was a man. In fact, that's what most of the false religions of this world try to do. They limit Jesus as, as a prophet. They'll say Jesus is only a man. He's less than God. They want to remove his deity but with a verse like this, there's just no getting around it. Jesus is God. God is his Father. And God the Father has extended all authority to his Son, Jesus. Yet at the same time, Jesus is a man who's acquainted with all of our sin. But he's never sinned himself. He understands us. Jesus, he knows what it's like to cry. He knows what it was like to be thirsty. He knows what it was like to hunger. He knows what it was like to be rejected by everyone. The scriptures say, we don't have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus has been tempted in every way you have, yet without sin. In fact, in, in here, and just maybe this is just one little thing you could remember when you read that verse out of Hebrews, it says, He, who, we, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. The word not have a high priest and unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. These two negatives drive the point home. And they say that your high priest, Jesus, will always, 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 always be able to understand you. Always. In our language, in English, those two negatives make a positive. But in this language, in the language these were given in, these actually mean you double down on the impact of the word. And so that we can always, 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 always know that Jesus understands our affliction, and he knows what we need. And the next part of the verse, it says, no one gets to the Father but through Christ. If you look at that right there, On verse 20, 27, it says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. Uh, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. There's people that jump to different words in that verse. I got a lot of friends that love to jump to the word chooses. That's actually not what the verse is telling you. This verse is about access to God. This verse says that whoever Jesus reveals himself to can know God the Father. And that it's Jesus who makes that possible. He says no one comes to the Father except through the Son. Jesus said this, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The main idea in this part of the scripture, before Jesus even gives the invitation to come, is you have access. You can come. The people in this part of the world, before Jesus came, the Jews, they had no access or little access to God. They had one person, one high priest, who would go into the temple one day a year in one little portion in the back room at one spot and make one offering. Now Jesus says, it's open. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's
It's wide open. Anyone who will come to him can know the Father. This this is about having the, the privilege of access to the Father. And I just, I leave, uh, one verse that's not in the Gospel of Matthew here, but it is in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus has the same exact conversation in the Gospel of Luke. And I have a feeling he probably said this many times. This was something he shared with the disciples and those around him. In the Gospel of Luke, after he explains the access he has to the Father, He says to the disciples, not to everybody else, he says to the disciples, the people who follow him. He turned unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them. And to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Oh, do you understand what Jesus is saying? He's saying the millionaires and billionaires of the world don't get it. They're blind by their own sin. The kings of the world missed it. The prophets missed it. The presidents, they missed it. But he says, you, 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 my disciples, praise God you've seen it. I hope you see how glorious it is to know Christ. You may not feel as though you have everything in this world. Praise God. Jesus says, blessed are you because you have seen. I know we could look at the news today and you could say, wow, boy, the the things I really want aren't happening or the policies that my state is voting on I strongly disagree with. Maybe the candidates you voted for are lost by a landslide. You may feel like you're in a minority, but one with God is a majority. And blessed are you because you do see. It's verses like this from Luke 10 that make me um, I just rejoice, even though it may look like things are crazy in the world. But blessed are you because you, God has opened your eyes to these things and you know Christ. Hmm. On verse 28 of Matthew 11, look at that with me. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus calls. He says, come unto me. If I told you today to come unto me and I said, everybody, come forward. You're not going to do it? Isn't this interesting? If I say come and you stay where you are, you don't get it. Or you do and you say, no, I won't go. Say, no, I'm comfortable here. I don't want to go up front and sit in the front row. If I said come and sit in the front, and you're like, maybe someone else will go first. I heard him say it. I should go up and do it. I always listen to what Bruce says because he says things that help me and they're good. And I should just do what he says, right? No. When I say come, you have to come. And Jesus calls them to come. They can't stay where they are. He says, come unto me. Who did Jesus call? Well, we know everybody heard. But he called, and people that came were people like Peter, Andrew, John, fishermen. Who else came? Tax collectors came. (laughs) Quite a few, too. 
Matthew and Zacchaeus came. The woman at the well came. Then all the people from the town who heard about her came. Because they heard about what Jesus did. And they said, wow, if Jesus can work on her, he can definitely fix everybody else here. So they all came in that town. The demon-possessed man came. The paralyzed man. A leper came. Candidates for the kingdom. Praise God. He said, those who are heavy laden, is he calling you? The call to those is those who are heavy laden. Has he called you? The heavy laden speaks of us as enslavement to sin. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So those who are heavy laden, they're the slave to sin. Jesus is calling them. He's calling people with a load of shame and guilt and their heavy load. Only Jesus can free us from the power of sin. He's calling folks who have a lot of shame. Don't let shame hold you back from Christ. Some people will say, I can't come to Christ. You don't know what I've done. I've got a record. Folks, Jesus knows. I think it's incredible that Jesus calls us with our shame. He calls you with a burden. He calls you to take the heavy load. Uh, It's sad. People in their worldly wisdom say, you know what? Um, I'll get right with God when I deal with this addiction I have. No, Jesus says, come with it. Come with it now and deal with it now. Someone says, I have a problem with so-and-so and an issue with bitterness. Come now. Come to Jesus now. He can deal with you. He can take your problem. He can take your load. People say, I love my sin, but I know I need Jesus. He's calling me and I'm hearing him. Come now. Come and trust Jesus now. He will give you the power over that sin. You'll never win a battle with sin in your own power. You just won't. It's a spiritual battle. No one can win it. Only Christ. He's calling those who are helpless. He's calling those who are laden down by those who think they can please God in their own works. There's folks, and maybe you're one of them. Maybe I'm talking to you today. You think you can please God and earn your forgiveness by something you're doing. You think, you know what? I've done some wrong things, and maybe I can just balance that out with some good things. Most of the world's religions are that way too. If you can just attend their service, give money to their cause, participate in their rituals, celebrate their holidays with them, you can be a part of their religion. That will never earn your forgiveness. God is not pleased with that. Jesus is calling people to come who will bring no merit with them. They don't plan to earn it. They just want to come to Christ and say, Lord, take my burdens. You'll bring nothing to Jesus. Your righteousness and mine before God is as filthy rags, the scripture says. So Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are laden, heavy laden. Are you tired of fighting with sin? Are you disappointed with the promises that come from our world leaders? Are you disappointed with the latest book or method that would tell you to help or solve your problems? I'm always amazed. You look at like a New York Times bestseller list. There's like a how-to book in every one of them. And that's because that was the latest thing that someone thought would help them. 
Have you spent all your money on doctors and therapists to deal with your feeling of emptiness and loneliness? Have you achieved worldly success and still found emptiness in your soul? Has the world insulted you and rejected you? Well, then come. Come to Christ, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come now, and Jesus will receive you. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus gives rest. He says, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. You won't have to work your way to heaven anymore. Jesus says, I'll give you rest. What I've done is enough for you to rest. A rest of salvation. A rest to know your sins are forgiven. You can rest in knowing that God's accepted Jesus' sacrifice on the cross fully on your behalf. It had completely satisfied the wrath of God. You can trust that Jesus gives freedom. He gives the rest of freedom. Hallelujah. Freedom from the power of sin. This is one that's really important. Uh, I hope I get your attention on this one. When Jesus died on the cross, Hebrews 10.14 says, Through his one single act, he has given you rest that allows freedom over sin. No longer a slave to sin, but having power over sin through Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he, in that act, gives you power over sin. You say, I'm tempted. I don't know if I can deal with the temptation. Trust Jesus. He gave you and transferred the power to you through his death on the cross. It's like those checks I never cashed. I'd be a fool if I got to the store and said, I don't have the money to pay for this. I got six weeks of paychecks at home. All I got to do is cash them, right? The same way with Christ. His work on the cross gives you the power over sin. We must trust him. We're no longer a slave to sin, but have power over sin. Please don't miss this. As a follower of Christ, you have power over sin through Christ. It doesn't control you. Jesus can control it. Jesus gives a rest from fears because he is the Lord of heaven and earth and all things are under his authority in this time and in the future. Jesus said this, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Right? He says, what you eat or about your body or what you put on, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They don't have storehouses or barns, yet God, your Father, feeds them. Does anyone in here ever struggle with fear? I do all the time. I do all the time. You might not think about it. I mean, I know you do all the time, even though you don't admit it. Oh, how much more of value you are than the birds in which you of being anxious can add a single hour to a span of his life. Oh my, we have no need to fear the Lord is with us. The Lord is the light in my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Oh, you can, you can let your fears go to God. What will happen next year? I don't know. Trust God. Relax. Give it over to God. Well, what about this problem? I I don't know, but I know I can trust God. What about my health issues? I know you can trust God with them. What about our food? Will we have enough? What if there's another food shortage? 
Trust God. Don't, don't submit to the fear. Jesus has promised to go with you. He says this. He says, take my yoke. This is the command. He says, come. That's the first one. The second is, take my yoke. I think when we think of a yoke, we think like, wow, that's a heavy object. I think of old wooden yokes with like leather on them that used to go on an ox or a horse. And there's two of them side by side and you pick them up. And, you know, my back goes down because it's so heavy. This is not Jesus' yoke. He describes it as a light yoke. Think of it as a life vest. If I was in a canoe paddling to you, let's just say we're in the lake, and I throw you a 25-pound weight, and you go and grab that, you're only going to have a harder time swimming. Oh, the world is throwing you 25-pound weights every time. Every time you say, oh, if I could just fix myself, it's like getting another 25-pound weight from someone. Yet when Jesus comes along to us, he gives us the life vest. It's that which makes us float. We're no longer drowning anymore. His yoke is light. And I think of the description of a yoke as its connection. Not only is it light... But it connects. It's a firm connection. When you see two animals in a yoke, they are firmly planted together. In fact, out of all the hardware on them, that yoke is the object that ties them together. They have different reins that go back to the guy around the sled or the wagon, or whatever the item may be. But the yoke is what keeps them together. And I just think about this. Through the yoke, you have a permanent connection to Christ. You are firmly fixed to him. The yoke describes how you are connected to Christ. I chuckle at how we communicate sometimes. I do have pet pony words that I just despise and hate. I use them myself, though, um, because sometimes I don't know what to say. I've heard people say, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I've used it myself. But let me just take that and let's just deal with that real quick. If, if I told you, I have a personal relationship with Julia, my wife. We've been married for 18 years. We have six children together. We've been through everything you can go through in 18 years as a couple. We've moved. We've had problems. Um, We've both grown in Christ together. And I said, you know, I know we've been married 18 years, but instead of calling her my wife, I just tell people we have a personal relationship. You see, the yoke, Jesus uses the word yoke because it's, it's such a good picture. You are so tied to him. Everywhere you go, he goes with you by his spirit. And nowhere can you go that he will leave you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He won't. I remember last summer, at this very time, uh, David Reckner gave a message on a Christ being forsaken so you would never be forsaken from Psalm 22. And that what that's saying is that because God turned his back on Jesus at the cross, he will never turn his back on you. And the work that Jesus did and his payment allows you to have a yoke with the Father through Christ at all times. You'll never be forsaken. You'll never. I love to use words like, I'm a new creation in Christ. People say, um, are you a Baptist or Presbyterian? Uh, what denomination are you? I say, I'm born again. They don't know what to do with that. Because that's what Jesus said. You must be born again. I guess I could start saying I'm yoked to Jesus. That's my new denomination. But, um, yeah. Let's think about that for a moment. How, do you, how would you describe your closeness to Christ? Is he, is he on the other side of the yoke? Oh, I pray he is. I know he is if you're born again. 
I know who he is. And he says, learn from me. Right there at the end of this passage, he says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find a rest for your souls. My burden is easy, and my yoke is light. He's saying, learn from me. He's on the other side of the yoke. Why are you trying to go that way? And he's trying to go this way. Follow his direction. He's saying, learn from me. I'm taking you here. Don't try and go the other way. Don't try and get on your heels and hold back. If he's pulling you forward, he says, learn from me. Follow his lead. Let him be the one who leads in the connection, the yoke. Keep moving forward. Oh, I, I count many. This is a difficult one. This is stuff I pray about all the time. I pray that God would keep growing and maturing deacons and elders and men and women or in faith in Christ, that they would keep maturing and growing. Oftentimes, a comfortable life causes people to become stagnant and stop growing. It's something that's just such a, it's a concern to me and I pray about. But the Lord's not leaving you stagnant. You may be on your heels. You may be stopping him and holding him back from pulling you into the next place. He wants to carry you by faith. But you'll need to let go and, and let him take you there. Those things God is showing you to do, he's showing you those things on purpose. He's giving you a conviction on purpose. Hmm. Some are in this cycle of um, closeness to God and then kind of stuck in a trend of not being close to God. Close to God, not being in it. And I see it all the time. Um, it's sad that they even begin that cycle. I'm saying, just stop. Just move forward in Christ. Let him take the yoke. Let him lead. He has bore your burdens. He has power over your sins. He is right there next to you. I think about how it says Jesus is gentle. He's not forcing. He's not forcing his will upon us, but he's giving it to you in an offering way. No one will say, Jesus forced me to come here. It won't happen. Jesus is gentle, and he leads you forward. Hallelujah. I thank God for that. Oh, I thank God that he is so gentle. He'd have every opportunity to be harsh with me. I deserve that. But Jesus is still gentle. He gives uh, wicked people mercy. Like me, he's gentle with us. Jesus says either he's either taken your burdens off from you or he hasn't. If you can understand this call, Jesus is calling you. If you're not convinced of this, think about your sins for just a moment. Think about your lies. Think about your hatred, your jealousy, your lust, your adultery, your rebellion, your blasphemy, and mocking of God. And folks, I stand guilty of these I understand your position. But think about this if you're not convinced. Do you feel that Jesus would not forgive you? Do you think Jesus would not forgive you for those things? You are wrong. You don't understand him. He will forgive you. You think he is like you. He is not like you. He is merciful.
He who is without sin willingly gave his life for those who are the enemies of God. So to come to him, all one must do is come to him. You don't have to go to a place. You don't have to be there at a certain time with a certain person. Jesus is saying, come to me. He wants to hear you from your heart. Turn to him and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Confess your sin to him. Agree with God about your sin. That's what confession means. And God will hear you. He will forgive you. He is not like me or like you. He forgives. And he's taken your sin and moved it as far as the east is from the west. Two points that won't cross each other. I thank God that Jesus is not like me. Jesus will never fail you. When he says, come unto me, we can trust him. When he says, take my yoke, we can take and bear with him his yoke. And you will find rest. You will find rest. You will find rest from your sin, rest from your fears, rest from works. You will find rest in Christ. I, I just praise God that, you know, he does work with people like me. Uh, I am one of those, every, every sin I named off in there, I, I'm guilty of it either with my hands or in my heart. And God has forgiven me. I enjoy a light burden because of it, not of my own at all. But I just want to encourage you today, if you're struggling and you know Christ, he's in the yoke with you. He's given you a power over sin and power over your fear. If you say, I, I, I don't know that I've confessed my sins, confess them today. Jesus will forgive. You don't have to do anything to earn it. Turn to him today in a humble spirit and say, Lord, forgive me a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. And he will forgive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, that you're our Father. I pray for those who are struggling, Lord, who, who are dealing with these things that, Lord, you've put in your word today. Lord, would it be fear, trials, sickness, whatever it may be, Lord, I just lift Lift these things to you, Lord, to the group here. and I just pray you'd help us, Lord. I pray, God, for those who hear the, the invitation today to come to you, to go to you. Father, I pray they would go and not hesitate another moment, and they would know they could live a life with you, tied to you like a yoke. I just pray you'd move on their hearts today. I thank you, Father, that you opened our eyes today. Help us to go off this week in, in power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, lead us and direct us. Help us not to go against you, Lord. Help us not to be back on our heels. But Lord, help us to move forward in faith. Thank you, Father, for the power of that you have given us over sin. And we know that we can trust you, and in every trial you'll make a way of escape. Father, help us this week. Help us to be servants of yours. Help us to, to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.